Today's video is brought to you by Ground News. Learn more by going to ground.news slash Vice Rhino today. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with Mike Winger's video responding to an atheist written article. Again, these videos are in a playlist if you want to follow along from part one, but he doesn't seem to refer back to things that he said earlier very often, so if you haven't seen the others, it should still make sense to you. So let's take a look! But first, have you ever found yourself fed up with news outlets feeding you stories with a partisan bias without making their bias clear? When reading the news, one of the first things I've always felt the need to do is figure out what biases the organization has, and whether or not they have a reputation for factual reporting. Well, with the sponsor of today's video, Ground News, parsing this out is easier than ever! Let me show you. If we check out the story about Marjorie Taylor Greene filing a motion to remove Mike Johnson from his position of Speaker of the House, we can see with an easy-to-read visual breakdown that, of the 14 sources covering the story, 57% of them have a left-leaning bias, 21% are in the middle, and another 21% are on the right. The sources reporting on this are pretty evenly split when it comes to factuality rating, with 43% being generally mixed and 43% being generally high. Half of the sources are owned by media conglomerates, with 23% being independent news outlets, and we can see that Newsweek was the first outlet to break the story on Thursday the 21st. They also have a bias comparison tool, where you can quickly see the different aspects of the story that are highlighted by outlets with different biases. In this case, we can see that the left is concentrating on Green's confrontation with Johnson and using that to highlight the turmoil within the Republican Party, while the center seems to be getting more into the specific details about the complaints against Johnson. There's no analysis of the right-leaning news outlet's coverage of the story, as there hasn't been enough coverage from the right in order to perform that analysis, which means that this story is likely a blind spot for people who only get their news from right-leaning sources. With Ground News, you can easily sort articles by things like factuality, location, and bias, and follow specific topics that interest you, like atheism or politics. Subscribe through my link for 40% off unlimited access to the Vantage Plan, which is the one that I personally use. Again, go to ground.news slash vice rhino for 40% off their Vantage plan. Ground News was the first company to sponsor my channel, and I've been personally using their services ever since. Subscribing today not only gets you access to a great product at an amazing price, but it also directly helps my channel. So thank you. Number four, let's look at argument number four. The quote from Frederick Nietzsche is, Christianity was from the beginning, essentially and fundamentally life's nausea and disgust with life. Merely concealed behind, masked by, and dressed up as faith in another or better life. Now to the informed Christian, you immediately recognize this quote as being pure mockery that is utterly baseless. So fun fact, before hearing what Mike had to say about this quote, I spent a bunch of time reading the original work, reading essays written about it, trying to understand it, what it meant in context, how it related to the rest of the book that it's found in, which is an examination of ancient Greek dramatic styles contrasting the Dionysian to the Apollonian, and doesn't really have much to do with Christianity at all. In context, it's contained in a foreword that was written when the book was reprinted, and was part of a small discussion comparing Christianity to art, and pointing out that the obsession with truth grounded in God essentially relegates all art to being a mere falsehood. But then I remembered who I'm responding to here, and I figured I might have been putting in too much effort at this point, so I listened to hear what Mike had to say. And yeah, that was a bunch of wasted time. Instead of putting in all that effort to actually understand what Nietzsche was saying here, I could simply have pointed out that Henri de Lubac, one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, referred to it as a work of genius. A highly respected Christian theologian thought that this work of Nietzsche's was a work of genius, and there has been philosophical study and debate about this work for over a century now. But you know what? No worries, guys. Mike Winger is here to tell us that informed Christians can just dismiss it as being pure mockery that is utterly baseless. But if you are a pop atheist, you think that's exactly what it is. You know, my general distaste for philosophical argumentation has occasionally left me feeling inadequate. Like, maybe in all that technobabble sounding jargon, even after I think I've parsed it out, I might still be missing something. I find myself constantly re-examining philosophical discussions and arguments that I've examined a bazillion times before, wondering if maybe this time something new will click in my brain, allowing me to see it in a new light and have a better understanding, but with the constant fear that there will always be something that I missed. I am now finding myself jealous of the confident ignorance that Mike constantly displays, where even a cursory examination of the words being said irrespective of context is apparently unnecessary. Like, just read those words and then think what they might mean. 
Christianity is life's disgust with life, concealed behind faith in another or better life. On its face, ignoring the context, what that appears to be talking about is how Christians are encouraged to not worry about this life, but instead concern themselves with making sure they get into the good afterlife, because it'll be so much better. And that is not pure mockery that is utterly baseless. That's a pretty close paraphrase of the words of Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, where he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So unless you for some reason, think that the words of Jesus Christ are just a baseless mockery of Christianity, then I think this quote deserves a more serious treatment from you. I'm to speak pastorally here. Those who are prone towards bitterness, towards, uh, towards leaders, towards other people in their lives, they will be drawn to this kind of argumentation. It just fits their mentalities. Also great theologians, but at this point, I think it's pretty well established that that's a category that does not contain Mike here. However, if we can be united in our disassociation, disassociation, dissociation, sorry, from real life, we can be happy. We can call this dissociation faith. I'm always enamored by the weird definitions of faith that atheists will offer. Well, the definition that I'm partial to is the one that's found in the Bible in the book of Hebrews. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Ignoring, you know, actual linguistics, use in Greek and Hebrew in the Bible, or in actual careful, thoughtful Christian theology, Faith is just trust, right? It's, it's, it's a choice to trust. Here's the thing, though. Faith and trust do have two different meanings in modern English, and the scholars and linguists who translate the Bible know that. So if faith just meant trust, then they wouldn't have translated it as faith. They would have translated it as trust. So I am going to trust that the experts who translated it as faith had good reason for doing so. Actually, scratch that. Why should I bother putting effort into understanding the nuance and intricacies of the Bible, the translation process, the etymology of the various important words in multiple languages, etc., etc., when you can't even be arsed to Google a single quote from a dissenting voice to make sure you properly understood its context before dismissing it as baseless mockery? I've already put more effort into this one video than you have in the 50 minutes of your video so far. And yes, that is how far into Mike's video we are at this point. It was a long one where he said almost nothing. The reality is all we have is each other, connection and this life, anything more is hopeful delusions. I'm gonna argue that this isn't even something you have on atheism. You're going to argue that the connections we make with people in the one life that we know for sure we have is something that we don't actually have? I'm curious to see where that'll end up. I've also noticed that this, this painful truth about religion is made up of people who are intensely afraid of reality and of the truth of the human condition. Now I asked you guys to notice that that phrase there, that it assumes that atheism is true in order to prove that it's true. This is the absolute best example of circular reasoning. Well, if I were to steel man the argument, it seems to be getting at the fact that Christians don't behave as though they believe that Christianity is true. And I don't mean some Christians end up being hypocrites who don't practice what they preach. I'm talking about how when the chips are down, when dealing with things like grief and loss, Christians act the same as atheists do. When a Christian loses a loved one, for the most part, they grieve just as intensely as an atheist. This should not be the case. If Christianity were true, you might be a bit sad that you won't get to see your loved one again for a while, but it wouldn't be grief at the same intensity as an atheist who knows that the loved one is gone forever. It'd be more like if the loved one just moved to a different country. Sure, you'll miss them, but you'll see them again eventually. It's not goodbye forever. Like, remember how the Christian response to non-Christians bringing up the fact that God kills a lot of people is to say something like, if Christianity is true, people don't die, they just change location? If Christianity is true, people don't die, they just change location. Well, if y'all actually believed that, you wouldn't be any sadder about the loss of a loved one than you would if that same person just moved away. So to say that religion is made up of people who are intensely afraid of reality is essentially to say that, rather than face the truth of something like the loss of a loved one, the religious retreat into the belief that it's only temporary, while knowing deep down that it's not true. It's kind of like a Romans 120 reversal thing. You know in your heart that Christianity isn't true, you just deny that truth and your desire to not be sad when someone you love dies. But you end up being sad anyway because you really know that it's not true. I don't entirely agree with this line of argumentation, but there is more to it than Mike is letting on. Shocker, I know. We should totally expect an apologist of the everyone knows that God is real because the Bible says so variety to put more effort into understanding what a circular argument really is here. This connects to the idea 
that is carried through the rest of the passage that people know there's a God. The truth of God is just obvious through creation. It's obvious that there's a God. And to hold back or resist this, it requires you to push against this truth, to suppress it. You Christians, you know how I know you're wrong? Because you are desperately denying the truth of atheism. That's how I know. My God, he's even using the exact same language as the Bible when saying that it's circular. How does he not see it? And actually Christianity, unlike say new age beliefs or the beliefs that we're all divinity and we're just sort of discovering our, you know, like Christian science type stuff, that type of thing is very different than Christianity. Christianity is a sober view of the human condition, right? Because all religions aren't the same. Is Christianity a sober view of humanity or is it just a degrading one? I can have a sober view, recognizing that nobody is perfect and everyone has done some shitty things in their lives, but Christianity takes that to the extreme and says that because you have done some shitty things in your life, it doesn't matter how much good you did, it can never make up for it, you deserve to be tortured for eternity. I might not agree with other religions either, but there are few that have as demeaning a view of humanity as Christianity does, which I guess Mike sees as an argument in favor of Christianity for some reason. Christianity says you are sinful, you are fallen, and you have judgment coming upon you because of your wickedness. Yeah, see, there it is. We're all horrid, wicked people who deserve eternal torture. I thought about a butt once, so obviously that means I need to be spanked forever. Spank me, daddy. But it also teaches that humans are made in God's image and that we have this incredible value and we have this incredible potential to know God and to, to love God and to love others. And we have this incredible daunting responsibility before God one day for all those things. Yeah, but no matter how good you get at any of that, you're still a horrible, wicked person deserving of hell and you'd better prostrate yourself before God lest he inflict that torture upon you. It teaches that God loves us, but there is only one way, Jesus. It's exclusive. This is not something people like. Even, even Christians will try to get around it sometimes to try to get away from the exclusivity of, of having faith in Christ um, or the idea of hell. Some Christians do try to get around that, yes because they recognize how immoral it is to reward heinously immoral people like Jeffrey Dahmer with eternal paradise while sending good people who happen to just be non-Christian to hell. Their innate sense of morality that you would use to argue in favor of God's existence finds your God's system to be immoral, so they construct a better merit-based system. Here's a question though. How does atheism do the same thing? How does atheism handle the human condition and the reality of what's going on? By looking it square in the eye and saying, yeah, some things about life suck, but this is the only life we get, so we should work together to make it as enjoyable as possible for as many people as possible. I don't give to charity in the hope that it'll earn me a bigger mansion in heaven one day. I give to charity because I can, and I recognize that my giving to charity will help people who are in need so that I can do a bit to make their lives just a little bit better. Is it possible that atheism is actually afraid of reality and that atheists are denying the truth of the human condition? It's possible, but so far I've seen no good reason to think so. I think it is, and I can give a case for it. Go for it. I expect nothing but the highest tier evidence from bottom rung Mikey at this point. In atheism, you don't have any real grounding for believing in moral values and duties. This has caused many atheists to deny the reality of moral values and duties. So your case that atheists are deluded in denying the human condition is entirely predicated on an argument from consequences? You don't like the idea of a universe that doesn't contain inherent moral values and duties, so you conclude that this cannot be the case? I don't know, man. You're supposed to be convincing me that it's me denying reality, but if you believe in Christianity because you don't like the implications of atheism rather than because of an actual examination of the arguments and evidence, that seems like it's still you denying reality. And worth mentioning is that there are atheists who do believe that there are non-theistic justifications and groundings for objective moral values and duties. They do exist, but I am not one of them. In fact, I'm rather of the opinion that even if a god does exist, that does nothing to ground morality. I Either morality is subjective, just with God as the subject instead of us, imposing his subjective morality on us through the might makes right system that is divine command theory, or morality is independent of God, making God nothing more than the communicator of morality at best, not the source. And then play weird word games about subjective and objective. The projection is strong with this one. Is it a weird word game to use those words to mean what we understand them to mean instead of having to wiggle out of their meaning by appealing to God's nature as somehow not being a part of God in the subjective sense, but still tied to God? 
Something is subjective if it's dependent on a subject. In your view, if God doesn't exist, then neither does morality, so morality is dependent on God as the subject. If morality were objective, then it would just be a fact about reality irrespective of the existence or non-existence of subjective beings. But basically, it just causes them in that worldview to deny that those moral values and duties are real. That it's truly always wrong to torture a baby for fun. Oh hey, it's been a while since I've come across a clip that I can add to the torture babies for fun montage. That we know that it's objectively wrong to torture infants for fun. Every one of us knows that torturing an innocent baby for fun is wrong. Do we understand that torturing babies for fun is really wrong? That it's truly always wrong to torture a baby for fun. The qualifier for fun is quite telling in this one. As an atheist, I am free to just say that torturing babies is wrong, no qualifier is necessary. But as a Christian, given that God has tortured babies to death in the Old Testament, you need the for fun qualifier in order to be able to condemn the torturing of babies, while still allowing for a situation where you can't say that it's wrong all the time, like when God killed a bunch of babies through drowning, one of the most painful ways to die, or the babies who get terminal illnesses and live short, pain-filled lives. As an atheist, I can look at such situations and declare them to be tragic without having to find a moral justification for a being actively inflicting them on people, because the expectation of a godless universe is that there is no higher power looking out for us, so sometimes horrendously painful things happen to even the most innocent among us. But as a Christian, at the very least, you have a god who has stepped aside to allow such a situation to develop that they could have easily prevented. But if you believe that everything happens in furtherance of God's plan, then he didn't just stand aside, he is directly responsible. And so in your quest for such justifications, you wind up with apologists saying horrendous shit like this. It was actually a tremendous blessing to these children for them to be killed and go to heaven and be with God. An atheist is kind of at a place where their worldview is forcing them to deny that scary reality. Absolutely not. I am perfectly comfortable saying that torturing babies is always wrong. I can even say that if maximizing well-being and minimizing harm are goals that we can agree on, then by using that as the measuring stick, it is objectively wrong. And this is probably what he was referring to when he said that we have to play word games with subjective and objective, but this isn't a word game. The goal, maximizing well-being and minimizing harm, is subjectively chosen, but whether an action gets you closer to that goal or farther away from it can be objectively measured. Of course, this does mean that morality is ultimately subjective, as even this objective measurement relies on the choosing of a subjective goal, but unlike Mike, I don't then say, I don't like that it's not ultimately objective, therefore it must be wrong, because I recognize that my dislike of a concept does not alter reality to make that concept untrue. Why is it scary? Because it also means that things I'm doing are wrong. Well, if my definition of wrong is what we're going with here, which would be taking actions that move us away from the goal of maximizing well-being and minimizing harm, then if I am doing something wrong, I want to know about it so that I can stop. The problem here is that you're using a definition of right and wrong that doesn't appear to have any basis in reality. If I am not convinced that your god even exists, then why should I care that you say he thinks it's wrong for me to have sex without being married? I care about actual harm done to actual people, not the arbitrary opinion of a being that can't even be shown to exist. And for the record, I do recognize some of the problems with utilitarianism that could lead to immoral actions being called good by way of moral math, but the nuances to my position aren't really relevant to this video, so I'll just leave a link to a video where I went more in depth on the topic. Be gentle in the comments on that one, though that was the first video that I made after making the decision to transition to being on camera in my videos, and the camera work reflects that. There's many atheists that would actually agree and say, like, like Sam Harris, they say, hey, consciousness is an illusion. You don't really exist, you just think you do. Consciousness is the one thing in this universe that cannot be an illusion. Oh, sorry, I should have prefaced that. That is a direct quote from an article that Sam Harris wrote on his blog about the nature and implications of consciousness. This isn't Sam's book. I, I know it's a convincing facsimile of Sam's books, but uh, I never really got into his stuff even when I was into the Four Horsemen of Atheism thing. So I printed out a blog article and stuffed it in a book so that I could say that with an air of intellectual superiority. Now, he does go on in the article to explain that there is no physical evidence for consciousness. A physical examination of the brains that contain consciousnesses can show us a complex system of feedback, reaction, interaction, and whatnot, but it will not yield an answer to the question, what is it like to be that brain? This is the problem of solipsism. 
I personally have no conclusive physical evidence that any conscious minds exist in the universe aside from my own. I can logically infer that other beings that behave in a similar fashion as I do have consciousnesses, because I see no reason why I would be the only one, but what if those other beings are themselves illusory in nature? I know that brains have imperfect perception, and that certain drugs will alter that perception such that I can induce experiences that are entirely hallucinatory in nature. So how do I know that this is not what is making me think that the entire universe exists? And my answer is simply that I don't think I'm special enough for me to be the lone inhabitant of the universe. This might be philosophically naive, but when push comes to shove, it doesn't actually matter. My experience of the universe is such that I feel confident in believing that other conscious beings exist, and if I start behaving as though this is incorrect, then whether I'm right or wrong, it will have a negative impact on my experience, and whether reality outside of my experience is real or not, my experience itself is real. And I'd prefer that that experience be positive rather than negative, so it works out in my favor to act as though the world is real, regardless of whether or not that conclusion is correct. And oh, god damn it, I've gone and put more thought into Mike's words than Mike has again. Okay, Sam Harris literally said the exact opposite of what Mike just said that he said. End of story. No clarification required. We're done here. Who's the you thinking you do? I don't know, because that would require a you. It's, it's self-refuting, but at any rate, you don't exist, and you're just, you're just having a delusion that you are, which again is self-refuting. No, hard solipsism is not self-refuting. Well, I'm assuming that that's what he's talking about rather than the absolutely ridiculous statement that he's actually making. This stuff can be hard to parse out sometimes, and I can see how a description of solipsism could lead one to think that it equates to a belief that consciousness is an illusion. So if you're stuck on the bottom rung of apologetics like Mike is, conflating those things is kind of expected. But yeah, solipsism is not self-refuting, it's more of a thought experiment. And what's more, it's not even linked to atheism. Just just because you can name an atheist that pointed out that it's difficult, if not impossible, to conclusively refute solipsism using physical evidence, does not mean that it's the default atheist position. Hell, if I actually accepted solipsism, I wouldn't even bother making videos like this. What is the point in arguing with people who don't even exist? But guys like Daniel Dennett, atheist philosopher, would agree there is no consciousness on atheism. I very much doubt that Dennett would actually agree with that, given that he has written and spoken extensively about the difficulty in fully communicating the experience of consciousness, explaining it like a cell phone. You can ask me what's going on in my head, and I can tell you, but no matter what I say, it will not give you the full picture. There's a myriad of thoughts, experiences, emotions, sensations, perceptions, etc. that are impossible for me to fully communicate. Just just as watching a YouTube video on your phone doesn't fully explain which transistors in the phone's processor are on or off, when they switch, what bits are stored in RAM, whether or not it will switch which tower it's connected to for improved signal, and so on. Your phone is always doing stuff that, even if you are the most qualified of experts in all the relevant fields, you'll just not be able to be aware of. And consciousness is like that. The most qualified experts can study it, learn about it, and figure out different aspects of how it works, but ultimately, we can't ever fully learn about someone else's subjective experience externally. This does not mean that consciousness does not exist, it means it's difficult to study and quantify. I think atheism is denying the obvious here. I think they're denying reality in order to support atheism. And I think you haven't put in enough work to figure out what atheists actually think on the matter. Even if we did assume that Dennett and Harris were accurate representatives of what is apparently the monolith of atheist thought, which to be clear, they absolutely are not, and atheist thought is not a monolith. You literally said that Sam Harris believes the exact opposite of what he actually said, and are now using that to back up your earlier statement that you don't think that atheists even have each other. Since you need to either lie or be so grossly incompetent as to not be capable or willing to do the two seconds of googling to figure out whether or not you're saying a true thing in order to reach that conclusion, you have effectively demonstrated that your belief about atheist beliefs is itself an exercise in denying reality. I think they have a belief in atheism that forces them to reject obvious truths about reality. Moral values and duties, consciousness. How about purpose? True purpose. I don't deny that my life has purpose. I just get to make the choice of what my purpose is for myself, rather than having to accept whatever purpose you think God has for me. We, we have a real purpose and a, a function in life. Now that can be scary because if you have a purpose, you can be failing that purpose. So what is that purpose, Mike? 
You have this in a list of things that are supposedly obvious truths about reality, which either means that my purpose is so generic that it can apply to anyone, so that would be the Christian view that our purpose is just to serve God, blah blah blah, boring, or it's something that is specially tailored to me, but it's an obvious fact about reality so anyone who knows me should be able to tell what it would be, unless it's only obvious to me? In which case, how is that different from me choosing my own purpose? I do what I'm passionate about, and that's what seems to obviously be my purpose to me. So who are you to say that I'm wrong? But on atheism, you must deny your purpose. No, I must deny the purpose that you think applies to me, but which is not at all obvious to me. Beauty. No real beauty on atheism. Objective beauty. I'm not even sure that objective beauty is a coherent concept. Beauty is what I find to be aesthetically pleasing. This is an entirely subjective experience. It is so obviously a subjective experience that the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, is a tired cliché. There are things that I think are beautiful that other people disagree with, and vice versa. If sentient alien life exists, it probably looks nothing like us, and would not find anything about the human form to be aesthetically pleasing. So no matter how much I might think it's an objective fact about reality that Scarlett Johansson is beautiful, these aliens would probably not agree with me. And I know of no atheists who deny that beauty exists. But to claim that beauty is somehow objective when it is so very obviously subjective is just strange. He then describes religion and says, it comes from, catch this, religion's origin, it comes from our hatred for our loathsome existence and our deep desire to deny the actuality of death and of future loss. While that is a bit more of a bleak outlook on life than I have, it is a fact of reality that religion tends to do better in populations that live in poverty than in ones that have relative abundance. And while correlation does not necessarily equal causation, there is reason to believe a causal link in this case. To quote the Pew Research 2018 report, in places where people face a constant threat of premature death due to hunger, war, or disease, feelings of vulnerability tend to drive people to religion, which in turn provides hope and reduces anxiety. In countries with advanced economies, meanwhile, people are more likely to feel safe, in part because technology and infrastructure investment in these societies have helped people overcome many common health problems, cope with severe weather, and deal with other types of emergencies that can cause existential anxiety. Combine this with how religion ostensibly helps with the loss of loved ones, and it certainly begins to look like humans have a tendency to turn to religion in an attempt to comfort themselves with the idea that someone is in control, and even if things suck now, that someone will make everything work out for the best. So while the article you're responding to didn't exactly put it in the best possible terms, the point that they were driving at does appear to be accurate when you actually look at the data. Yet. Yet atheism also has a rejection of future loss, which is hell and judgment and standing before God. Rejection of a future loss that cannot be demonstrated to actually be real in any meaningful sense is in no way the same as turning to religion out of desperation and a need for comfort and relief from the horrible situations in this life. To pretend that it is, is disingenuous. I've met atheists who are very happy at the idea that they that they will have no eternal life because they think it would be unpleasant, especially hell, or they have weird views of heaven. While I can't exactly say that I'm happy about my future non-existence, it is preferable to either of the Christian options, yes. Like they think heaven would be bad and boring and they don't want to be there, and I just think you're you're not really you're not really thinking about that. Like you you maybe you don't maybe your view of heaven is like that, you know, harps and clouds and singing 24-7. Um, and that's that's yeah, that's from a Bugs Bunny cartoons when you were a kid. Like that's not <laughs> that's not from scripture. What is from scripture then? It's made out of precious gems and metals for some reason, which would be super gaudy and cause them to not be valuable. That's actually a running theme in Christianity, the complete lack of awareness that scarcity is a crucial part of the value equation. Everything in heaven will be made out of these super valuable materials. Okay? Why? It wouldn't look nice, and everyone having unlimited access to it would mean that you can't trade it for anything, and you're not even supposed to want for anything in heaven anyway, so why would having so much gold be a good thing in the first place? But the Christian failure to understand basic economics is irrelevant here. The Bible says so little about what heaven will actually be like that any time an apologist or preacher talks about it, they are inevitably just making shit up. And I've been to enough church services where that was attempted to have seen how different the picture of heaven can be from person to person. Like, the actual biblical description is just a physical description of a city, New Jerusalem, which is supposed to be very pretty. It's got a great high wall with 12 gates, it's a square that is about 2200 kilometers long on each side, the walls are jasper but the city itself is pure gold, the gates are adorned with different kinds of jewels, there's no sun or moon 
because God is shining on it all day, every day. There won't be a night, blah, blah, blah. Such a bland description. There is next to nothing about what people will actually be doing in heaven. Now, we can draw inferences from some things, like how in Matthew 22, 23 to 33, the Sadducees asked Jesus about a woman who had been married to seven men who all died in what I'm sure were not at all suspicious ways, wondering whose wife she would be when they're all in heaven, with Jesus answering that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So there's no marriage in heaven, presumably meaning there's also no sex. Also, whatever permanent injuries or disabilities you suffer in this life will be carried over into heaven, as Jesus said in Matthew 18, 8 through 9, that if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, because it's better to enter life crippled or lame than to go to hell with both hands and feet. Same goes for eyes. And that's basically it. From this, preachers are left to their own imaginations in creating heaven, and they all go about it differently, with most ignoring the you keep earthly wounds part. I've heard preachers say that it'll be like a permanent worship service, that it'll be just like this life but without any of the bad things, so you still have a job but you'll love your job and find it perfectly fulfilling. You'll still have your family and loved ones. You'll either have your memory of the loved ones in hell wiped, or somehow you'll be changed to be happy about them being in hell. It'll be like a life where you get to do anything you want any time you want, but everything you want to do will be sinless things. And there's a bunch more descriptions that I've heard that don't all get along with each other as well. Christians can't even agree on what heaven will be like. So why should I take you seriously when you explain what it's not like? Christianity comes from obvious facts about God and morality, which we would call natural revelation. Which are only obvious if you start with their truth as an a priori assumption and ignore all the data to the contrary, like the fact that morality is very much not a universally agreed upon concept. Of course, you get to dismiss that as being the result of the fall, but this has the effect of making it a completely unfalsifiable claim. It can never be proven wrong, because any time we agree on morality, that's clearly because God wrote it on our hearts. But any time we disagree, that's clearly because of our fall in nature. How could a concept that slippery possibly count as evidence for anything? Like, these facts about morality are only obvious if you don't actually think about them at all. As soon as you put any thought into them, they become much more complicated and less obvious, so that's out the window. Obvious facts about God were also a part of that, to which I would just ask, what obvious facts? The attributes of God will change depending on who you ask. Mike Winger, Stephen Anderson, and the Pope all call themselves Christians, and yet when you ask them to describe God, they will each describe a different being with different attributes. Sure, there will be some in common, but there will also be pretty massive differences. And which attributes are in common and which are different will shift as you ask different Christians for a description of God. So clearly these attributes aren't obvious facts about God. Right? You can arrive at that through critical thinking. You'll just arrive at very different conclusions from nearly every other Christian on the planet, because as it turns out, each Christian tends to think that God agrees with them, and then disagrees with all the other ones. And research has shown that when a person's beliefs evolve, their beliefs about God's beliefs evolve with them, and originates in the same area of the brain that their own beliefs come from, rather than from the area of the brain that their evaluation of other people's beliefs comes from. To parse that out, when people think of their own beliefs, an area of the brain that is associated with self-referential thinking is activated. When thinking about other people's beliefs, this area is not activated. When thinking about God's beliefs, the self-referential area is active again. When the same person has a change of heart on a particular matter, they continue to report that God agrees with them even after their change of heart, and the same brain activity happens. So these obvious facts about God end up being obvious because they are in perfect alignment with what that person who believes in God already believes for themselves, rather than being obvious because they are objective facts about reality. And two, special revelation through Jesus and the Bible, which can be historically proven and critically looked at, textually proven. Proven is very strong language there, Mike. There's more evidence for the claims made by Joseph Smith than there is for Jesus' resurrection, if only because he was writing so much more recently. But one wouldn't expect that to be a problem for an all-powerful god that actually existed, right? There's actually a whole uh, area of research that's just like the, the textual connections in scripture about the unity of the Bible that goes even beyond my Jesus in the Old Testament stuff. Really? Well, I'd be interested in seeing some of that scholarship, especially given that the way we figure out whether some of the New Testament books attributed to Paul were authentic was by examining the message to see how unified it was, and found that some of the books espoused positions that ran counter to Paul's positions in the authentic books. So given that the disunity of the message between various Bible books is an important metric for figuring out details about the books themselves, like who wrote them, when they were written, what sect of Judaism or Christianity were the author's target audience, and more, 
I would be very surprised indeed to find these scholars agreeing that there is perfect unity of message throughout the whole of the Bible. At any rate, you have a special revelation of God in Christ, and that's also recorded in the scripture, which means that Christianity is based on the idea that God has revealed himself to us. Well, that's nice and all, but if that idea turns out to be false, then that idea ceases to matter in the slightest. And we can confirm this by looking at these sort of uh, miraculous elements in the religion. Yeah, it's a miracle that when you ask a Christian who believes the Bible has one single unified message, whether or not the Bible has one single unified message, they will tell you that it does, even though scholars will use the lack of a unified message to figure out actual true things about the Bible. Christian scholars at that. I'm not talking about atheist scholars here. This is just how the scholarship surrounding the text of the Bible works, and most of the scholars engaged in the study are themselves Christian. For every Bart Ehrman, there's 10 Dale Allisons. And yet apologists like Mike Bottom Rung Winger ignore all the scholarship in order to promote simplistic ideas about how the Bible is actually just one unified book. Is there some loss that atheists might be trying to deny? Yes judgment and control over their lives that God would have. Yes, to repeat, atheists deny the existence of a future loss that you will only find out for sure exists after you die, while the loss that Christians deny is the actual loss that happens when a loved one dies. We deny a hypothetical loss that is claimed to exist without evidence. You deny a real loss that nearly everyone experiences in their life. These are not equivalent. You can argue that you don't deny the real loss if you like, and I'd actually be inclined to agree because of what I said earlier. Christians grieve just as hard for their lost loved ones as atheists do. But then that takes away one of the defenses of religion that even atheists can be found promoting, the idea that it helps people cope with loss. Even to the extent that it does accomplish this, I don't think that a denial of reality that the loss is actually a loss is really helping someone process their grief. Now, that said, it would be hypocritical of me to ignore the fact that there is research on the subject, and that research has found that a belief in the afterlife and in a controlling force guiding our life events, not to mention the community of like-minded believers that offer support, does indeed have a positive impact on a person's ability to cope with the loss of a loved one or the idea of them future dying. But notably, as with most of the research that comes to the conclusion that there are positive mental health effects of religion, this was not specific to any particular religion. So, Mike, I presume that you would agree that non-Christian religions that believe in an afterlife are not true, correct? So why then do the positive effects of religious belief not remain constrained within the one true religion? Not all religions can be true, but they can all be false. And even if I grant that a belief in the afterlife does really help people properly and fully process their grief, it still remains a true statement that this is a false belief that denies reality. And I'm sure Mike could agree with that statement about the beliefs of the non-Christian afterlifes. So given that, can he really say that the atheist position that the exact same thing applies to Christianity is unfounded? Is there some loss that Christians could be trying to deny? Yes, they, they could be trying to deny that they're going to die and then cease to exist. Yeah, okay, that too. I forgot about the existential aspect of it. My bad. I guess it's a bit closer to being comparable to an atheist denying the afterlife, but it remains a demonstrable fact that everyone will die at some point. But the claim of an afterlife has no such evidence. But does that mean they are? because there is some loss that could be there. No, there's evidential reasons to support Christianity. I haven't seen any good evidential reasons to support Christianity. Are you planning on providing any anytime soon? This argument assumed atheism was true and concluded it was true. Yeah, projection again. That is entirely what you have been doing with Christianity through this whole series. However, if we can be united in our dis dissociation from re real life, assumes atheism is true. We can be happy. We can call this a dissociation faith and together we can be free from the horror of existence. Religion allows people to forget that we are on a rock zipping through the cosmic abyss at hundreds of kilometers per second and that eventually our sun won't even exist and our planet will not be a memory, will not even be a memory. And this truth is something that people desperately scurry away and hide from. Existential dread is real. And while I generally wouldn't phrase it like the article has, because unlike Mike, I don't want to come across as a condescending asshole, the point it's getting at is a very real one. Even if there are psychological benefits to believing in an afterlife, the fact remains that it doesn't matter which one you believe in. The benefits are the same across the board. So you would likely agree with me if I were to say that a Muslim is denying reality because both of us can agree that the afterlife in Islam is not real. So either way, it's still a reality denial. But yeah, all that stuff about how fast the sun is moving and whatnot is largely irrelevant. 
Now, let me just say that does not describe Christianity. What he's described there is more like Buddhism. So you don't agree with all the Christian apologists who assert that if this life is the only one we get, then it's effectively meaningless. That's interesting. Buddhism does actually have a view that they want to um, escape, right? Escape. That is the goal of Buddhism and different branches in Hinduism. I've seen Buddhists who will happily agree that Buddhism is a form of escapism and are entirely unbothered by that accusation. But I'd also be willing to bet that there are Buddhists who disagree. Probably the same for Hinduism with what I understand of it, but ultimately, I don't really give a shit. I'm not here to attack or defend Buddhism or Hinduism. I'm here to respond to the ideas that Mike is putting forward. And to say, essentially, but other religions are a form of escapism as well, doesn't really take away from the fact that pretending you'll go to a happy place and be reunited with all of your loved ones when you die is also a form of escapism. The idea is this whole experience is torture. And we want to get out of it by not caring about it, by transcending it, and by escaping this reality. Are you saying that that does not apply to Christianity? That is fundamentally what is at the base of every worldview that has some form of paradise as a reward at some point. In Buddhism, it's mainly that desire is the basis for suffering, so if we can teach ourselves to no longer have desires, then we will reach a point where we will no longer be suffering. And this point is nirvana. In Christianity, if you're besties with Jesus when you die, then whatever you may have suffered in your life won't even matter. It's all gone, and you've got eternal paradise to look forward to. These are two forms of escapism that have the same goal. Get away from suffering. One does it through the elimination of desire. The other does it through the ultimate fulfillment of desire. And honestly, if I'm examining this as an outsider, at least the Buddhist one has principles that can lessen your suffering in this life if you follow them. So Buddhism seems better if I were forced to choose. And then you just kind of stop existing. That is the goal in Buddhism. I don't know that the cessation of existence is the actual goal, but at least if atheism is true, then it's the end result no matter what. So again, may as well do what we can to make this life as pleasant as possible for as many people as possible. There's different branches in Buddhism, but that is the goal in Buddhism, at least in a, a prominent number of Buddhists. And I'm sure that given your stellar track record thus far representing ideas you disagree with, that this prominent number of Buddhists will have no issues with what you say? Okay, that would, that would be a desire to escape the horror of existence. I get that. No, that would be the quest to abstain from desire so that the horror of existence loses its power over you. However... However, this is not Christianity in any way, shape, or form. So you don't believe in an eternal happy place that you'll go to once this life is over, where there will be no more suffering and no more pain and no more death and all that? Christians are very sober and real about suffering and about the difficulties of life and about how hard it is and how bad things are. That's definitely true. So are Buddhists. I don't think I've ever heard a Buddhist deny that life is hard and full of suffering. An acknowledgement of this fact is kind of their whole thing, with the desire causes suffering, so if you learn not to have desires, you'll just cease to suffer. Just because you disagree with their methods doesn't mean that they don't agree that suffering exists. Look at how the atheist describes reality here. The reality is, all we have is each other, connection, and this life, anything more, is hopeful delusions. Is there evidence supported for this? No, it's pure assertion. It's indoctrination based on the definition I offered earlier. It is not critical thinking. I sort of agree. I would rephrase it to say that our best evidence indicates that interpersonal connection in this life is all we have. There is no evidence for anything beyond it, so make the most of it. That way it's less dismissive while still getting effectively the same point across. That's all we have. However, there's a problem. On atheism, we don't have each other. We don't have connection. And we don't really have this life because on atheism, I think the consistent atheist would say that I'm not really here. Why would the consistent atheist say that, though? I mean, sure, you seem to think that Sam Harris thinks that, but you never explained why it is that this would actually be consistent with atheism. You just said that's what Harris thinks and then moved on as though Harris thinking it would make it true for all atheists somehow. Con in fact, if you want to grant consciousness, I think consciousness itself, human consciousness, is an argument for God's existence, a strong one. I would actually agree that it's one of the strongest ones. So the fact that making physical and chemical alterations in the brain makes corresponding alterations to the consciousness with no apparent external controlling force is pretty damning, as that renders it a pretty weak bit of evidence. If your strongest evidence is pretty weak, then what's that say about the rest of it? Right, but, but if, I'm just, if I'm just a meat robot, if I'm just brain and chemicals firing, then, then I'm not even the same Mike who started recording this video. And if your brain has its corpus callosum severed, then the left side of your brain won't even be the same Mike as the right side of your brain. Again, you not liking these facts does not render them untrue. Besides, as I learn new things, I grow as a person. I am not the same Vice Rhino who started this YouTube channel, and for that, I am greatly thankful. 
I'm a much better person than I was back then because I've continued to learn and grow. I do not mourn the loss of 2016 me. That guy was a dick. Instead, I rejoice at the possibility of what 2025 me could be. I'm the same. It's not even a consistent. I don't continue to even exist from second to second. I'm just the firing of chemicals and electrons in my mind. I, I'm not even a me. So we don't have each other on atheism. There being a physical explanation for our subjective experiences does not negate the very existence of those experiences, and I don't understand why you think that it would. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from all of Germany. Okay, not all of Germany, just the people in Germany who watch my videos, which is roughly 15,000 of you in any given month. I commented last time Winger brought up Nietzsche that the translation being quoted seemed to have plunked in a couple of words that didn't appear to be there in the original German, but with the caveat that I don't speak German, so I could be wrong. And within a half an hour of the video going live to members only, I already had multiple comments from Germans providing their linguistic analysis and all confirming that my suspicions were indeed correct. And more to my surprise, I haven't yet seen a single comment correcting my pronunciation of Nietzsche. I had a whole joke I was going to put here about how you shouldn't expect me to be able to say it before I can even figure out how to spell it, and ending by calling him Freddy Nitz to avoid even trying to say it right. But. Now I don't even get to do that because y'all didn't correct me, so I guess the only conclusion I can draw here is that I do indeed pronounce Nietzsche 100% perfectly in exactly the same way as a native German speaker would do. Okay, now that I've driven off my fourth largest source of viewers by country, it's time for the proper send off. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to go to ground.news slash vice rhino for 40% off their vantage plan. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern and with my partner every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorships manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Soren Konstad and all the rest, who are the illusion that is the consciousness of my channel. If you you'd like to be the only thing in the universe that cannot possibly be an illusion, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO box address is in the description. See you next time! I guess he just recorded half the video before remembering to put the microphone on my shirt, and so it sounded far away. Hello, and welcome to my channel. And now I have to redo it. Sam Harris literally just said the exact, what? Where's my Buddhist cookbook? Your Buddhist cook, okay. I think it's behind me, just a sec. Ugh. This one? Yep, that's the one. Okay.